I would now like to introduce Jennifer Milne. Uh, Jennifer is a senior research program officer for the Precord Institute for Energy and the Strategic Energy Alliance at Stanford University. Jennifer will facilitate our session on bio-inspired solutions for carbon and introduce the two speakers. Over to you, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. You know, this workshop's about hybrid solutions and engineered solutions. And as you'll see, the biochar who David's going to talk about is quite, quite clearly in the, the hybrid because it has an engineered component to it. But one of the most important aspects that underlines a lot of these um, hybrid solutions we talk about are soils. Um, but without being able to measure or monitor or verify the amount of carbon that we actually sequester and that stays there implementing soils on a global scale for carbon management um, it's not really going to um, be one of the things we can do with integrity without those so pete is going to talk about um, almost everything else except for biochar to do with soils and he's going to talk about one of the most important aspects which is uh, monitoring and reporting and verifying the carbon that we can actually sequester in these soils and he's going to give some real world examples. Now with David's talk he's going to touch on a platform that he that actually exists on bioenergy and biochar so as most of you will probably know biochar can be used to supplement soils to increase uh, carbon in some some uh, instances. He's going to talk about some of the details there and talk about some of the products um, that we can get with that, some of the energy products. So with that, I'll introduce David. He's a professor, David Laird. He's a professor uh, in the Department of Agro Agronomy and Environmental Science at Iowa State University. Um, he's, his research interests are mainly in the use of pyrolysis. And I think today he'll talk about fast pyrolysis um, to process biomass into bioenergy and biochar and co-products co um, and also talk about biochar amendments to soil and uh, what that can do for soil quality. And I'll also introduce Pete just now so that we have a smooth transition uh, going between the speakers. So Pete Smith is a professor at Aberdeen University in Scotland um, and he his main expertise is in modeling greenhouse gas and carbon mitigation, bioenergy, biological carbon sequestration, and global food systems modeling and greenhouse gas removal technologies. So you can see their full bios on, on the website, but these, these folks are, are at the top of their fields and uh, really the best folks to talk to us today about these subjects. So with that, David, um, do you wanna start sharing your slides? Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, first of all, I, I wanna, Thank everyone for the opportunity to be part of this workshop and um, uh, really exciting uh, the last couple of days. And secondly, I wanna acknowledge my collaborators in this effort, uh, Robert Brown, who's professor of mechanical engineering and expert in fast pyrolysis technology and Mark Wright, who's also mechanical engineering and uh, is an expert in techno-economic analysis. And, uh, yesterday, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have to decarbonizing our economy are liquid transportation fuels, and in particular, jet marine diesel fuels, which cannot be easily displaced uh, with electricity. And uh, there are relatively few options for obtaining these, uh, one of which is biomass, and the other of which, of course, is electrochemical induction of uh, CO2. And uh, Second point I want to make is the overall role of soil carbon in this system. Uh, there is as much carbon in the soils as there is in the biosphere, atmosphere, and upper ocean combined. And then on an annual basis, around 120 gigatons of carbon are removed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis, and another 120 are returned to the atmosphere through, through combined effects of plant respiration and soil microbial respiration. So in any system to address uh, climate change, to remove carbon, we need to think about whether carbon is exit or exiting the soil 
entering the soil uh, to address this challenge. Uh, <clears throat> this takes me to what's called the Pyrolysis Biochar Bioenergy Platform, which is somewhat analogous to BEX. Uh, it's envisioned as a broadly distributed network of relatively small pyrolyzers that are producing a bio crude, which can then be sent to a refinery uh, for uh, production of liquid transportation fuels, and a biochar co-product, uh, which would be returned locally to the soils, ideally from which the biomass is harvested, and in so doing would uh, recycle plant nutrients, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, uh, that are harvested with the biomass, and at the same time provide highly recalcitrant carbon uh, to build and enhance soil quality. This has the potential uh, to initiate a positive feedback system in which we enhance soil carbon sequestration, at the same time generating a liquid fuels which are critically needed. Now, the enabling technology is known as autothermal fast pyrolysis. Uh, fast pyrolysis has certainly been around for a long time, uh, but two new innovations have made this, uh, moved this to uh, the forefront. Uh, the first of which is autothermal operation, which means you're titrating in just enough oxygen to make the reaction exothermic. Uh, this solves the heat transfer problem and allows a 7x scale up of the um, biomass throughput, the feedstock, uh, without any change in the size of the reactor. The second uh, advancement is, involves various stage fractionation technologies, which allows the physical isolation of uh, a sugar fraction, predominantly levoglucosin, uh, which can be in the first generation plants uh, fermented to make ethanol and in later generation plants can be used to make polymers, solvents and other products. A phenolic oil fraction, uh, which in first generation plants can be used directly uh, for the production of bioasphalt. And in second generation plants uh, can be uh, stabilized by hydrogenation and then shipped to a uh, existing oil refinery and turned into drop-in jet marine and diesel fuels. Uh, there is also an acetate fraction, uh, which is relatively low value, uh, but does have some potential applications, either as generating thermal energy or the production of other products. And finally, of course, there's the biochar fraction, uh, which I mentioned before, and which is critical in making the overall harvesting of biomass sustainable. Uh, Techno-economic analysis by Mark Wright uh, suggests that a 250 ton per day plant uh, can reach about a break-even uh, cost of production when the phenolic oil is selling for around $500 uh, per megagram, uh, which is in the mid-range of current prices for asphalt oil. Um, so the technology, Hi, David, um, David, I'm sorry to step in. Uh, this is Evan, your, your audio is cutting in and out. Um, could I get you? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Could I get you to, um, just stand Would this help? still? Yeah, it'll Does probably help? help, but it's probably okay. just a loose cable. So, so just try not to knock the cable too much. Okay. Sorry about okay. that. Thank you. Sorry. No, sorry. Um, the, the economic analysis does not include a current significantly more economical. Um, 250 ton a day plant is also, uh, well, all of these plants would be highly carbon negative because they are exothermic reactions, so they're not requiring any fuel. The biochar itself gets a high long-term uh, credit. Uh, if we're making a, a bioasphalt, there's at least potential for carbon credit for that. If the phenolic fraction is turned into diesel or jet, then that zeroes out. Now, I want to mention briefly the reason we're looking at a 250 ton per day scale 
is because of the, uh, well, there's certainly economies of scale uh, that increase with plant size, but at the same time, there is a negative uh, cost associated with biomass harvest, storage, transport, logistics. And we think about a 250 ton per day plant is about where those two lines cross uh, for at least corn stover in the Midwest. It will vary by feedstock. Turning to biochar, uh, there is a, um, first point is that there has been an enormous growth in literature with over 17,000 record publications in the last 15 years. And uh, emerging from this is a broad consensus that biochar is highly effective for storage carbon with a half-life in excess of 100 years. It also enhances soil quality, soil health, uh, in the physical sense by addressing bulk density, uh, soil porosity, water retention, chemical sense by recycling uh, uh, nutrients harvested with biomass and uh, functioning as a liming agent. And it also has impact on the biological properties of soil increasing uh, nutrient cycling. There are of course a large number of gaps and I've just mentioned a few of them here. Um, one of the key is the uh, value proposition for farmers. Many times, particularly in temperate regions, there's little or no yield increase. In tropical regions, there's often uh, a more obvious yield increase. Uh, developing optimum management systems for very diverse soil climate crop systems, defining and grading biochar, uh, system level LCAs, and the last two, priming and modeling, I will address in the next two slides. Um, priming is the concept of getting a synergism here. This is uh, an example uh, study in which 7.25 megagrams of carbon, biochar carbon, were applied in 2011, came back in 2017, and the total soil carbon had increased to about 14 uh, megagrams. In other words, the 7.25 that was applied was essentially still there, and then an additional 6.75 megagrams of carbon had accrued. And this is the result of the priming or negative priming phenomena, the fact that the biochar functions to catalyze formation and stabilization of new soil organic matter. Uh, this is, means, in a sense, the potential to almost double the carbon credit associated with the biochar. However, there's a question mark here, and this is because the literature is not at all consistent. We've seen positive, negative, and uh, uh, other types of reactions and net zero reactions. With them. So more basic research is needed. Um, secondly, I want to mention modeling. First generation models are now uh, available. Uh, in this example, predicting the probability of a crop yield increase across the croplands in the United States. However, the need is for a second generation modeling capability in which we can start advising individual farmers with individual crops, climates, management systems on the optimum management process for biochar. This brings me to uh, the summary. Uh, first of all, that the Pyrolysis Biochar Bioenergy Platform can provide critical jet marine and diesel fuels, drop-in fuels, and they're carbon negative. Secondly, this technology can be scaled to address the very serious logistics problems which I addressed earlier today. Uh, regarding biomass harvest, storage, and transport. Uh, thirdly, and perhaps uh, uh, of most importance, is the fact that biochar has the potential, if done correctly, to initiate a positive feedback system, which you sequester carbon in the soil, which enhances soil quality, which increases crop productivity, increases carbon input to soil, which sequesters more carbon in the soil. Uh, this positive feedback um, has the potential to increase the amount of biomass that can be sustainably harvested, going from maybe 50% crop residue to 75% of 
crop res residue being harvested, and at the same time can have uh, an impact on food security, food production by decreasing, or perhaps better to say, slowing the increase in the amount of land area needed uh, for food production. And of course, uh, this is intrinsically uh, located in rural communities and therefore has the potential to create jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities in those communities. With that, I thank you. Pete, are you ready to take it away? So hopefully you can see that full screen. Um, what I'll be talking about today is soil carbon sequestration, the technology challenges. But as um, Jenny outlined in the uh, in the introduction at the beginning, I'm not going to be talking about carbon sequestration per se. I'm going to be talking mainly about some of the technology challenges for monitoring, reporting and verification, which is the thing that's really uh, preventing uh, market penetration for soil carbon sequestration at the moment. So if we have a look at the technical potential, the reason we're looking at soils is because there's a, a large potential out there. So the technical potential for soil carbon sequestration is about 1.3 gigatons of carbon equivalents per year. That's carbon, not CO2. Um, and uh, the economic potential, if we just look at um, what's economic for um, between about 20 and 100 US dollars per tonne of CO2 equivalents, it's around about 0.4 to 0.7 gigatons of carbon equivalents per year. And as you can see on this graph, uh, which I've shown at the bottom, um, we've got some options, uh, that one over on the right, and the bottom, the bottom right hand corner is restoring histosol. So that's restoring peatlands. Um, you get a very big bang for your buck there. There's a lot of carbon that you can uh, 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 avoid emissions and also sequester um, up to about 50 tons of carbon per hectare per year, but relatively small areas. So on the Y axis, you can see is the area of the practice um, that in, in uh, millions of hectares that it could be applied to. So you've got a few uh, big ticket items, but available on fairly small areas. And then you uh, over on the right, uh, over on the left hand side of the graph, you can see those that can be applied to very wide areas. Um, and uh, but they have a lower mitigation potential per hectare. So this is where um, uh, biochar application, grazing land management, cropland management and those sorts of things fit in. So. The technology is very mature in terms of knowing how to manage the soil and knowing what will increase the soil carbon. Um, uh, but, but the thing that's holding us up at the minute, as I'll explain in a moment, is um, mainly the MRV, the monitoring, reporting and verification. So in a paper on uh, climate Climate Smart Soils, which came out in 2016 um, by Keith Paustian and colleagues, um, it we looked at the what, what you can do to, to restore soil carbon and we developed this decision tree, which basically you start at the top. Have you got degraded or marginal land? You can uh, uh, restore it to perennial vegetation. If not, have you got drained cropped histosols? If not, you, if you have, you can restore wetland. If not, you go to look at your nutrient deficiency and so on and so forth. So most of these options are to do with increasing the carbon input to the soil or reducing the carbon losses through reducing the intensity of tillage um, and increasing the uh, carbon inputs through things like uh, uh, improved crop rotations and uh, deeper rooted species. So those, the, those are the sort of techniques that I'll not be talking about today. I'm now going to move on to the reason why it's not currently happening at the scale that it could be. Uh, there are a number of issues. Um, so the first one is saturation. So um, as as you um, as you change your management practice from a low soil carbon level um, for the first time step, say that's five or ten years, you get a large increase in carbon stock. So that's quite a large removal of CO two from the atmosphere every year. For the same same time step, say that's five or ten years, you get gradually less and gradually less for the next time step until you reach a new equilibrium position. That could be between 20 and 100 years, depending on the soil type and the climatic conditions. But this basically means 
uh, unlike uh, carbon capture and storage, where you can store the carbon for a long time, uh, uh, for, uh, you can just continue doing it and every year you store more carbon. Uh, with all biological sinks and soils included and vegetation is the same. Um, when you, uh, sorry, when you uh, increase the soil carbon, it will eventually reach a new um, equilibrium position or saturation, uh, whereby after that time, you no longer get an increase uh, in soil carbon and you no longer get a net annual removal. The second issue is to do with non-permanence or reversibility. Um, these are some uh, just a couple of examples here, uh, a manure treatment on arable field and an, a woodland establishment. You can see them shown here in different colours, uh, but this is what happens when it turns into low input cropland. Uh, this is from a long term experiment uh, at Rothamsted and you see that the soil carbon plummets and drops down to close to its original level. So you have a very strong reversibility issue here, uh, which could either, either occur through uh, management uh, and not continuing a management practice or could occur through uh, natural climate extremes and natural disasters. And the last thing is to do with leakage and displacement. So in these two examples, we're taking manure from a field which contains manure and mineral N. We're moving it over to the field on the, on the left and we're putting more manure on that field. So we increase the soil carbon sequestration in the left-hand side, but we decrease the amount of carbon that's going on in the right-hand side. So the effect over the whole landscape is zero. So it's to do with uh, um, just to do with making sure that we account for the whole land surface, that we're not claiming credits where they don't exist. So all of these issues, saturation, permanence and liquid, leakage and displacement uh, get, um, affect, the, affect the confidence in so soil carbon sequestration as a, as a greenhouse gas removal technology or greenhouse gas removal option. So we have to find ways to show that the soil carbon is increasing and we have to find ways to verify that this is happening over large areas. So in a paper in 20, uh, uh, 2020 uh, in Global Change Biology, we put together um, a list of what, what, the, what, would be a, uh, what would be the perfect soil verification system. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes walking through this. It's a complex diagram. But the most important thing is that all of these different components exist already. It's just that they don't exist everywhere in the world. Um, they're not distributed equally in the world and they don't all exist in the same place and they've not been pulled together. But what gives me heart from this is knowing that, that all, this, all these components are together is that we could pull these together into a monitoring verification, uh, reporting and verification platform. So the first, the first component, number one, is the long-term experiments at benchmark sites. Uh, we have several hundred of these around the world, long-term agronomic experiments, which look at the impact of uh, a management change on soil carbon and have real measurements over many decades, up to uh, 150 years in some cases, of long-term change. Nested within those, number two are short-term experiments, which measure things like fluxes of carbon, and they investigate the processes and they're good for developing tools and calibrating models, which brings us to the soil organic carbon and greenhouse gas models, which are good for monitoring and, and reporting. Uh, we've got, they're developed using all these two data sets that I've just gone through. Uh, they can either be used to develop uh, tier two emission factors, or they can be used directly in a tier three method to directly model changes in soil carbon. But we need spatial data to drive those models, so data on climate, soils and land cover, and those all exist globally at quite fine spatial resolution and quite fine temporal resolution, so those are available. We need activity data, so that's just information about what the farmers are doing on the soil, what in the field and when. So the activity data tends to be collected through agricultural statistics. And in the developed world, in Europe and in North America, we tend to have really good statistics, which are available spatially, which we can use. But in the developing world, these are much more sparse. And we also have soil sampling and resampling that goes on on a grid, which can be used as an independent verification method to check that um, what, what we're looking at and what we, what we, what we think will uh, change in the soil carbon are actually changing. 
And lastly, we have the remote sensing component. Although you can't detect um, soil carbon directly from space, you can verify activity data and you can calculate estimates of above ground biomass. So calculate the inputs to the soils to run your soil models. So as I said, all of this information exists, all of these, these components exist, but they're not yet brought together in a global system or even nationally in a national system to allow confident monitoring, reporting and verification of soil carbon change. At the same time we were writing this paper, uh, my friend and colleague Keith Paustian was writing exactly the same paper, coming up with exactly the same uh, uh, conclusions, uh, suggesting a, a modelling activity measurement data platform, and he comes up with a much prettier conceptualization and a much nicer diagram, but effectively we're saying very similar things. And this was entirely independent. They were published relatively close together and we found out about each other's work um, after, after it had been published. But are there any other technology challenges? So um, there are a few things that are going on. So uh, for example, there are handheld devices that are now being developed that use spectral methods to determine soil organic carbon. Soil organic carbon is difficult to measure because you've got a very large background and a small change in soil carbon. So you need to take an awful lot of samples to detect a change and it can take many years to detect that change. What Yardstick have done is they're using uh, spectral methods, so that's mid-infrared and near-infrared spectroscopy, which is mounted, mounted in the end of the probe, uh, which is shown here, just connected to a, a normal uh, uh, DIY drill um, uh, that drills down into the soil, and it, um, it takes measurements of the, um, of the spectra, which are then compared to spectral libraries and are used to estimate soil carbon. And I've looked at this and the technology at the moment is not accurate enough to detect soil carbon change. But the hope is that you can take so many samples. It's so easy to take samples and get readings that you make up for the lack of discrimination in the tool by just taking huge numbers of samples all over the field. So this is being trialed against uh, some destructive sampling, uh, dry combustion methods to test soil carbon um, by this startup, uh, which is called Yardstick. I've given the links here. Um, and it's an interesting thing that may develop into something useful. And some other techniques that are available are, for example, using gamma radiation that's naturally um, uh, emitted from soil to map the soil and the soil properties. You still have to take soil samples um, and uh, you can then relate the soil samples to the, the rest of the soil properties. So you, this doesn't get around the problem of having to take soil samples and measure the soil carbon, but it, it may, by combining with these sort of rem remotely sensed uh, 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 machinery mounted uh, techniques to map the soil properties, um, it could have some uh, use in the future. It could have some use if combined with um, automatic sampling of the soils, which are then tested back in the lab. So we've got some exciting developments taking place. We've got all of the techniques uh, available. But as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, there are some difficulties in developing countries um, in, in, uh, maintain, in obtaining the data that you need for some of this verification. So in order to address this, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, that's the FAO, have started this project called RecSoil, which is, stands for Recarbonization, Recarbonization of Soils. And they've uh, established a, a, an MRV platform which relies on modeling um, and collects together a bunch of data sets which can be used um, in, in developing countries across the world. And this is a bottom up uh, a suggestion, a suggestion to do this bottom up so that uh, developing countries um, uh, opt into this scheme and they follow the this MRV uh, 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 protocol and they assess what soil carbon could be sequestered. And the hope is to um, attract some payments that can be then pay the land managers that are changing their soil carbon. Um, using this globally, uh, this global assessment, but which is done by the individual countries. So I'll just summarise by saying there's a great potential for carbon sequestration, especially in croplands, but also in degraded pastures. There's many co-benefits associated with it, so we should be doing it anyway. 
Uh, but in order to um, get there, we have to overcome these problems of demonstrating confidence that the soil carbon sequestration is, is real and, and stable. Uh, so the sink saturation, sink saturation, reversibility and leakage issues uh, need to be overcome by robust monitoring. So that remains one of our biggest challenges, the MRV, um, but all components of it exist to some extent, but it's uneven globally and they haven't been integrated in, into a single system yet. But FAO's Rexoil program is an opportunity that brings these things together, especially in developing countries. And as I mentioned, there are some new non-destructive measurement techniques that are in development. They're not quite there yet, but we need to watch this space to see how they develop and monitor progress because they could be a game changer in terms of making uh, monitoring, reporting and verification of soil carbon possible. Thanks for your attention. I'll leave it there. That's lovely. Thank you, Pete. Uh, yeah, that was that's quite an overview, quite a good reality check for us, but a lot of uh, inspiring uh, things to think about, too. So um, welcome, David, back again. And um, I'll just go through. We have a few questions in from the audience. So after about five so minutes of discussion, I'll turn to those questions. So, um, David, if I can ask you, you know, I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper to the biochar platform that you have there. And you notice quite a quite impressive um, potential for stabilization of soil organic carbon and soil organic matter. So. Um, is there, are there any circumstances in which that works better than others? So I guess I'm getting at, you know, the composition of the biochar and the composition of the soils that you're applying it to. What's, what's the optimum and what's, if you can get there also the potential, not just in the US, that was a beautiful map you showed the potential to do it there, but do you have an idea of like in the world, you know, other, other parts of the world that could apply your kind of model there? Uh, well, Thank you. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of diversity globally. And uh, in general, biochar seems to have a more positive effect on crop yields in tropical soils, acidic soils, uh, uh, depleted soils, whereas in temperate region soils, mollusols, uh, often there is little or no crop yield increase. With regards to the first part of your question, which was about the uh, positive feedback or the synergism, uh, first of all, let me emphasize that, again, the, the literature on that is not yet consistent and no consensus has been developed. Uh, however, uh, my observation is that we are see, tend to see this uh, when we see, tend to see a negative priming effect when there is a biogenic carbon input. When there's manure, when there's crop residue, root residues are added with the biochar on an annual basis. And we see positive priming uh, in fallow systems almost inevitably. Uh, so a clear balance is needed. That biogenic carbon uh, will, as Pete has pointed out, uh, be subject to more uh, ephemeral nature. It can be built up and it can be degraded depending on changes in management, climate, et cetera. Whereas the biochar carbon uh, is intrinsically more stable. Thanks, David. Um, so Pete, um, you know, you, you did allude to these, uh, some of these issues with um, saturation of the soils um, and also some of the measurement techniques. So. Um, I guess there'll be uh, part of understanding this is being able to measure and monitor and see what happens over time. Um, if we just step down to the, the kind of the ground level, as it were, and think about those, the techniques that you mentioned, the, um, the rod in the soil, you need a lot of samples with, and then the sensor on it looked like a tractor there. Um, so who would do those measurements and you know which are more likely to be implemented which in your your mind would be more valuable at this point in time or do we need all of them and you know is there a cost factor and, and an incentive factor to these and yeah we'll we'll start with that yeah sure so the reason we're not doing destructive sampling going and taking hundreds of soil samples and sending them to the lab is because the cost of doing that would be far greater than any carbon credits that you get from the carbon stored. So anything that we do to reduce that cost 
by non-destructive sampling, um, ideally with sampling in the soil, would help us a great deal. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in these technologies. As I said, they're not yet, they're not yet, not there yet. Um, but it's great that they're in development because we know that technology can advance very quickly and we learn by doing. So that could be the real game changer, I think. Something that could be done in the field. At the moment, these are being done by uh, people who know how to use them. But you could imagine in the future, you could just have something mounted on a, on a, um, a small uh, ATV or, or on some farm machinery that would take these measurements um, automatically as the tractor drives over the field. Um, in the same way as we have precision agriculture maps, which um, map out how much fertilizer we need on the field, we could be also be uh, measuring soil carbon. But even if we don't get there, even if we don't get to that anytime soon, we know, as I say, it's a fairly mature science. We know what activities cause increases in soil carbon. So we can, you could imagine a sort of a, a carbon payment system, which allowed carbon payments to be made based on just doing the activity, which you can detect from space or could be self-reported, or anybody can see whether you're doing tillage or not. And uh, the carbon payments could be adjusted after, say, five or 10 years, based on some real measurements. So I think there are ways forward and there are clever ways to incentivize uh, soil, carbon, soil carbon practices. But I just, I, I don't want to, I don't want to overemphasize uh, how simple it is. And the reason it's not happening yet is because of, because of these issues. So these are the issues that we need to, need to um, address. Great. And so we'll get to, um, I want to press on that a little further later, um, but go back to David again and, um, you know, we had a, I want to bring in one of the questions from, from the audience, um, because they were talking about some of the limitations um, for the feedstocks and the scalability um, and the, the water content and all of those things. So David, can you, can you speak to some of the challenges with, with your, the technology that you proposed um, and maybe how some of those challenges could be overcome? Um, uh, sure. Um, the, with the technology itself, uh, it, it, paralysis is relatively agnostic about the type of feedstock that you're putting in, but the quality and quantity of the products that come out are not. So you can put almost anything in a pyrolyzer, but the lignin content, the cellulose content are varying, the water content varies. Obviously, if you put a high moisture uh, feedstock in, uh, the energy to remove that water uh, could, could dramatically influence it. So one of the key limitations is you need to be able to sun dry the biomass feedstock. Um, secondly, uh, one of the issues is particle size. Uh, particle size needs to be reduced uh, to maximize the yield of the phenolic uh, fraction and other uh, uh, liquid products. Uh, otherwise, it increases the biochar. So there's a trade-off there uh, depending on uh, the value of the biochar as opposed to the liquids. And for the most part, we're seeing the greatest value coming from the uh, phenolic fraction, which can be turned into liquid transportation fuels. Uh, another key limitation is that the phenolic fraction, uh, if you just heat it up, it's very reactive and it will auto polymerize and basically turn into a hockey puck, uh, essentially equivalent higher heating value of, of anthracite with very low ash, make a great coking material and steel production. Um, however, to use it as a bio crude, uh, it's required that this be uh, hydro treated. So you're going to have to co-locate a source of hydrogen, presumably from electrolysis of water. And uh, that will derate uh, the energy value. Presumably the electricity can come from a, a zero carbon source, but it is a necessity. Um, the other key issue that I already alluded to during the talk are the logistics of biomass harvest storage and transport. And, and uh, the bigger the plant gets, 
uh, and the farther you have to haul that biomass, the more likely you are to have problems with uh, supply, uh, with um, uh, degradation of quality of your feedstock at a depot, uh, with um, uh, fire. Uh, DuPont built a, uh, 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 tried to build a, a, a cellulosic ethanol plant nearby and, and they had multiple feedstock fires. Uh, these are very serious issues. Uh, by keeping it small and widely distributed, uh, we can end up with uh, just-in-time delivery of that biomass and uh, reduce the costs of that. So there is a trade-off in those economies of scales and the logistic problems. Yeah, that's great. So um, just one last quick uh, question. Um, this we are, We've got more questions than we have time to answer, which is a, a good place to be in. So are the markets there right now, David, for the products that you were talking about? Um, and you know, I, I think you. I think before I learned that you can switch. You know, you can vary the products that you get out depending on that. So, what's the situation right now? Are the markets there, um, or is there? Does something need to happen to to make sure those markets are there in the future? Sure, there there, there are economies here. Uh, no existing oil refinery is going to take a single truckload of of phenolic oil. Uh, they want a unit train load delivered every week. And this means the system has to scale up to be able to provide it. And no one small plant like I'm talking about could do that. It's going to have to be an aggregate of plants working together uh, to fill that contract. Uh, getting through that scale up, there are some first generation products. I mentioned the uh, bio asphalt, uh, which uh, can be used directly without hydro treating of the bio or the phenolic oil. Uh, other products, the sugar fraction, uh, certainly can be uh, fermented to produce ethanol, uh, and that's fairly easy now. It can be blended with uh, uh, other sources of sugar. Uh, the acetate fraction, uh, relatively few markets for that, and that will have to be developed with time. Uh, the biochar, uh, clearly, uh, we, in our techno-economic analysis, uh, estimated a value to the biochar of $50 a ton. Uh, that's going to vary depending on the crop, the soils, the climate. Uh, and, you know, the farmer has to see a crop yield increase under the current economic situation to have a value on that uh, biochar. Great, thank you, David. So I, hopefully we have 30 seconds left. Pete, we have so many questions for you um, uh, from the, the audience. Um, and I guess, the, you know, one of them is about the acceptance of the various carbon credits uh, registries for the approach that you talked about for the MRV system. Um, and so it, the, this person, Ross, but Brickle-Meyer says that they understand registries require soil sampling more frequently than every 10-ish years to meet their MRV requirements. Can you just very quickly comment on that? Please? Yeah, so uh, uh, there, are, there are obviously different levels of um, monitoring and verification that are acceptable to different registries, um, but I think uh, Carbon Direct, who I do a little work for, is coming up with a, a sort of a, a what would make a perfect project uh, for all of the verticals, in fact, all of the different carbon removal technologies. So watch this space or watch carbon direct space, I should say, um, because we're going to be saying this is a this is the what would make the perfect project and how, how frequently you'd have to um, uh, monitor, uh, measure and monitor. But that varies. There are some uh, pretty crappy projects out there that have been funded, which only have very poor verification, um, as well as some really good ones. So the quality isn't uh, isn't uh, equivalent across all projects yet and that needs to change there needs to be more standardization across across different registries thank you so thank you both very much pete and david i think we could do this for half a day at least more um i, I see sarah's appeared so thanks again that was great yeah, thank you. Thank you to Jennifer, Pete, and David for an excellent session. And I'd also like to thank the audience for coming today. I hope you learned about the state of the art in these very important carbon removal technology areas, as well as their challenges. So please be sure to come and join us tomorrow for day three of the workshop. And we'll be discussing mechanisms for overcoming barriers, including issues such as scale, global commitment, technology diffusion and deployment, behavior and environmental justice, and financing. So have a great day and see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time.